first up is Dr. Rebecca Schneider on the revitalization of agricultural and dry land systems. Since the day is moving on, let's show her some love also. Thank you. Can everybody hear me back there at the back? It's a real pleasure to be here, and after hearing about all these different pieces of think thinking and thinking systems, I am honored to be part of this. One of the most challenging problems facing society is arguably figuring out how to grow enough food to feed our exponentially increasing population. It's estimated that in the next several decades, we will have to almost double the amount of food that was produced in 2006. The dilemma is driven by two interconnected factors. The first is the growing scarcity of fresh water. Since approximately 70% of all the annual water withdrawals are used to irrigate our crops. And this demand competes directly with other human health and human needs. Uh, severe water scarcity impacts 4 billion people at least one month each year. That was a paper that came out this past six months ago. The second factor is the serious degradation of the soils where we grow our food. And in this map, what you see are most of the soils are in some shape of degradation, high severity, moderate severity, very high severity. Most of those are our agricultural soils. And when you have poor soil, it takes more water to grow comparable amounts of, of crops. This is a planet-wide, multifaceted, and complex problem, what we've been calling a wicked problem. A great example of how system thinking can provide a powerful tool to identify possible solutions. I co-lead a program that's focused on addressing this problem. It's huge. I was overwhelmed. I thought I've never had systems done thinking or been trained. I need to learn whether I can get some solutions from that. And so I was applied to the Think Winter program and was delighted that I was allowed to contribute and be part of it. So how did the problem develop? Agriculture currently occupies approximately 40% of all the land surface of the earth. It replaced almost totally the original grasslands which occupied those areas. And in this map, all this yellow here, there's our Great Plains, all the yellow here, all the yellow here, these are our agricultural areas. There should be some here. I don't know why that doesn't show the compass. But what you'll notice is that a forgotten part about that is that grasslands are the natural biome that evolved to live in semi-arid habitats, places where it rains less than 24 inches a year, that's 600 millimeters of rainfall, down to eight inches of rainfall a year. The grasslands originally were highly productive without any supplemental irrigation. They supported millions of grazing animals, complex food webs, think herds of buffalo, herds of antelope, herds of wildebeest living off of grasslands that weren't irrigated. And one of the key mechanisms for the grassland productivity was the development of deep organic soils in which the decaying plant leaves and roots acted like a sponge that effectively captured and stored the scarce rainfall. And this is a mollusol soil, a grassland soil, this deep it's all this dark part here are the decaying leaves and all that act like a sponge. However, centuries and in some regions, millennia of humans clearing and harvesting plants and tilling the soil have resulted in the erosion and loss of this essential life supporting soil layer. For the past six years, I have been part of an international team of scientists working on the restoration of seriously degraded grassland systems along the Yellow River in northern China. This was a grassland, it looks like a desert where we're working and now in the Great Plains of the United States. We have been developing recipes for jump-starting soil restoration, and basically it's by incorporating coarse woody material into the soil itself in order to replace the lost organic matter. And we have other ingredients, and we've also been creating branch shelters which help to shade and cool the soil. And this is a photograph from our site in northern China. Anything green out here has been irrigated. These are our plots here. And what we've been able to successfully demonstrate is that, yes, with amendments, we can actually increase the amount of rainfall captured and then also maintain higher soil moisture for weeks after the rain event. So here's one month in time. Here's soil moisture content. Here's the soil. This is with our wood chips in it. Basic soil is 98% sand. And this is what happens after a rain. And they get about a centimeter of rain every 10 days. It is not a desert. And here's what happens in the natural, in the sand, it's there. And this is what happens, how much water gets captured. After 
during the rain event when we add wood chips into the soil. Here we actually have branch shelters over. And we also can maintain higher soil moisture content for weeks after the rain event. This was so successful that we have been able to revitalize these systems. And this is in, after 20 months in July, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the summer. And these are moths and mushrooms growing under our branches. And then this summer we went out there, we found lizards and families of hedgehogs living in our shelters. And we didn't even know there were hedgehogs there. It was a real shock. All right, so then let's get back to what is think water? What is system thinking have to do for this, all right? It helps tackle these complex problems in a, several different ways. And I think it's really going to be key to training graduate students. I teach two, gra uh, two classes, one on sustainable water resource management. I work with graduate students. And the first thing is that it's the precise, deliberate, and careful choice of what word you use to pick your identity or your concept. Because that in, it actually helps to clarify our understanding of the biophysical processes and also the goal. So here's an example. We've been blithely calling this restoration or restoring these systems, but using that word implies we're restoring it back to some condition that used to exist. And then we have to ask the question, well, what was that condition? Are that, is it achievable? Is that really what we want to do? And if, if we're trying to go look at biodiversity, restoring communities of organisms, then that's a good word to choose. But perhaps the right word is revitalization. In many places, it's unlikely we'll ever get to be able to return to what the original conditions were. Instead, we're trying to save water, reduce irrigation demands, grow plants and crops. And so maybe revitalization is a better word. And so it's the precision of the word choice. And I can show you many more examples where you go, oh, that's not what I mean. I mean this. And therefore, how I study it or what data I collect will be different. All right, number two, the principle that everything is composed of parts was directly relevant as we develop our recipes for soil restoration. Farmers routinely do soil tests to determine how much fertilizer is needed to grow a, a given crop. And that's been going on for 100 years. What, how much fertilizer do I add? But soil is not just one big glob. It's actually composed of a lot of different pieces. There's mineral grains, there's nutrients, there's organic matter, and there's microbes. Now we're starting to think about holistically soil health. We need to take all those pieces into account. And as evidence of that, the USDA in 2014 created the first soil health initiative with a director of the entire program focused on soil health. For us, it means, well, wait a minute, we have 98% sand. We don't even know if there's microbes in that stuff. It's, I mean, it's so barren and hot. So we need to add a microbial inoculum as we think about the recipe. What are the pieces we need to add? Focusing in on this wood, the wood that we add to the soil, we, we actually started to think, well, what's the size? What about the species? And it turns out it makes a big difference what kind of wood you add to the soil. Populous tremuloids is trembling aspen. You see it everywhere. It grows around the world, and they place it all over China. You put wood chips in the soil, they decompose about five years. It's fairly quick. That means it's gone. However, if we add black locust, Robinia sudataceae, it can last for 80 years. We, figuring out that we can actually sequester large quantities of carbon. Finally, the last and perhaps one of the most important parts is the issue of perspective. It's not enough to come up with a technical solution. I'm a hydroecologist. I focus on the biophysical parts. But we also have to figure out how to get the relevant stakeholders to buy in and adopt a different way of doing things. That's the farmers, the ranchers, the government staff. And that means we have to understand what are the barriers and incentives to get them to change behavior? Is it awareness? Do they need resources or equipment? In particular, and now I would go back and, and add a whole arrow from all these up to soil. Only recently I've come to realize that uh, farmers, ranchers, and people ge generally uh, tend to assume that what they experience is the way things are supposed to be. What they grew up with, that's the norm. That's, so we'll go back and try and just keep it at that level. When we first came to Ningxia, we spent two whole days driving around trying to find some soil organic matter. They didn't have a word for what we were looking for, and they didn't understand what we were talking about. We've seen similar things, though not as severe, working with, that, with researchers out west. Through a process of historical amnesia over centuries of soil decline, we have, people have forgotten 
the grassland soils that used to cover 40% of the land surface are supposed to look like. We accept these degraded systems as a norm, but we don't have to give up. Our work shows there's hope for what we can do in the future. And I believe that this sort of thinking approach is a way to teach our scientists to help solve these problems. 